and also starting, my switch wasn't on, and also starting our potluck July 12th. So that would be two weeks. Uh, the bulletin says next week, but it would be two weeks from um, today, this week. So the July 12th, we'll, do the, we'll start the potlucks up again and also will be the men's business meeting. So come prepared for that. On the 3rd, which would be this coming Friday, um, 5 p.m., bring lawn chairs and see Dina for details. The Myers are opening up their home for all those who could make that. So put that on your calendar and get with Dina to find out what we're supposed to do. And no, don't put it on your calendar. Side dish, no. Just what? Bring a side dish. Oh, bring a side dish and a lawn chair or pull up the floor. So side dish and a lawn chair, you don't need to see Dina. You, you can just look right there, just see her. So remember the Ladies Day in Stevensville, Montana, Saturday, July 18th. Uh, details are on the board in the foyer. Uh, let's continue to remember those that are in need of prayer. Yubi's traveling on the 1st and 2nd to uh, Calspell for additional tests and hopefully they'll figure out what to to do to help him out so he can eat a good piece of steak again he's looking forward to that uh, also remember connie bellamy she's recovering from appendectomy um, remember kyle westfall he visited with us wednesday um, and uh, for his friend zoe who is suffering from seizures. Um, keep him in your prayers. He, can, he uh, had, a, had a concern for being baptized. He probably needs to be studied with. And I know several of us talked to him after church, so let's keep him in our prayers. Um, keep Wilma in our prayers. She's here this morning. Good to see you, young lady. Uh, she's not as shut in as we thought, so good to have her here. Um, a note from Jill about um, Ruby Miller, 18-year-old girl who was abducted in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I don't know if there's any update on that. Yeah, they, have, they have dogs and the police and everything, and they have had no luck yet. That's sad. Let's keep her in our prayers. My cousin Tom Condos had back surgery, and. Uh, He's really struggling. It's a very slow recovery. He can't even hardly pick up a pot of coffee or anything. So for someone who's active to have to sit around and do nothing plays hard on your emotional. Yeah, Yubi? That's also a very good note. Thanks for reminding me, Yubi. Sometimes we wonder if the outreach programs work. But... We know Glenn came here from a house to house, and Kyle came, and who knows who else they will reach out to. So our efforts are well worth it. Um, also, we have a lot of people traveling this week. Coming up on the 4th, we have uh, uh, Aubrey will be here um, this coming weekend. Also, my sister's coming up from California, and... Um, Shauna and Rob will be here, and Tim and Shalice will be here, and also uh, Will's sister's daughter and her kids will be here. So the Campbells and the Hoffs will have a full house. So keep, keep them in our prayers for the traveling, anyone else that may be traveling during this time. <coughs> Charlene? Yeah, let's keep him on his strength in our prayers for spiritual guidance, guidance, and help. A lot of lot of us in our lifetime go through struggles, and it seems like old Satan is always right there with all the wrong answers that lead us into wrong things. And I know we've all been there. So let's keep him and um, Nat Miles and Artie and Marcus all in our prayers that they see the light again in the Lord and come back to us if that's applicable for that. Did you have something? Oh. But, and let's all pray for each other. I mean, we all need spiritual strength. 
because he's knocking on the door all the time with all of us. Yep, for all of us. So let's remember to keep other and all of us in our prayers. So this morning as we start our lesson, the first song will be song 722. Jeff will be leading us in the singing. And let's, let's focus on the Lord and let's put our full attention on him this morning. We owe him everything. Let's bow. Dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for this opportunity to gather as a family in love and come here to worship you and sing these songs and praises to your name. Be with Paul as he opens up your word, Father. Give him a ready recollection of the things that he studied, Father, and help us to take those things home and study them on our own, Father, and definitely apply them to our everyday life. Be with all those who's on our prayer list, Father. Bless each and every one of them. Comfort them. Be with the doctors that are ministering to them, Father. Help regain them to all to a better portion of health. Be with the ones that are suffering, Father, spiritually, whatever the issue may be with them. Help us to reach out to them, but Father, keep your loving arms around them and help them see where they need to be. Dear Abba, Father, be with the ones that are traveling. Keep them safe. Give them a safe trip here and back home again, Father. Be with all those that are traveling throughout this time. Be with this country, Father, and the direction that it's going. Heavenly Father, we pray that more and more people will turn to you and help us, Father, to be a guide to some of those who we can reach to. Watch over us, forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. He gave his precious life for me because he loved me so. You know, I was thinking this week, thinking about this, of the cross. There's a song in our song books that I don't, I don't particularly like called The Old Rugged Cross, but that's me. But in it, it says, the emblem of suffering and pain. Could you imagine the suffering and pain that Christ went through on the cross? You know, we, we look today of all the different ways over time that people are put to death. More modern times, injections, gas chambers, electricity. Back in the day, they hung people. But for the most part, all of those are pretty much instantaneous. Maybe a minute or two is all it takes. But you think about the agony of a cross, the physical ag ag agony first. First, you're nailed to a piece of wood, which wouldn't be enough to kill you. And before that, Jesus was beaten and scorned because he loves us so. I think if I had to choose a way to die, that would not, that would not be one I would ever even consider. And I don't think either of us did. But Christ willingly went to that cross because he loves me so. What an awesome savior, savior we have. We were talking last week a little bit about how the Holy Spirit intercedes. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. How the, how the Holy Spirit intercedes our prayers so that we get across our point in a way that we have struggles doing it. We have a Savior that died on the cross. That was the only way we'd find our way to heaven. The perfect sacrifice. No one else qualifies. No one else can do what he was able to do. Like the Holy Spirit's able to relay our messages to God. What an awesome Savior we have. This morning as we're instructed, we come together around this table to remember that sacrifice that he made on our behalf. In Luke chapter 22, when Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper, Supper it says, and it says, and when the hour, verse 14, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and when he had gave it, gave thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourself. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And likewise, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you and is a new covenant in my blood. And then he goes on to talk about the one who's going to betray him. This bread that we're about to partake of represents that body that was beaten, that was scorned, that was hung on that cruel cross. And we do this to remember that. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and share communion, to give thanks for the great sacrifice Jesus made as he went to the cross for our sins. As we partake of this bread, which represents his body, let us do so in a manner pleasing to you, Father. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. this bow. Fathers, we continue around this, the Lord's table. We ask the blessings upon this, the fruit of the vine, which to us represents Jesus as he suffered on the cross and died and bled and dead and died for our sins. We ask that this time as we dismiss of all the cares in the world and focus on the cross, Father, what he has done for us is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This morning in class we were talking about humbling ourselves. I can't imagine anybody being more humble than our Lord and Savior when he went to that cross. Likewise, we are to be humble. Too many times we let our pride and our possessions get in the way of what we need to be doing. This morning we have an opportunity to give back a portion, which we've been so richly blessed. None of us, none of us, if we gave everything, wouldn't be worthy of Christ. But we have a lot of people out there that need the Lord, that need an outreach in some way. We're blessed to be able to do some of these outreaches, the house to home, the children's home, the Bear Valley. We're so blessed that we can do that, that we can reach out to those. We have an obligation also here in our community to be a beacon. We're up here on the bar, we can be a beacon to this community. All of it takes funds, and the Lord has asked us to give as we've been blessed, to the best of our ability, as we have purposed, not just what we have left. Let's bow. Dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for the blessings we have in you each and every day, and the blessings that we have, Father, in everything that we do. Dear Heavenly Father, be with us here. We pray that we can give back in accordance to your will. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that the leadership here uses these funds completely in accordance to your will to help further your word to a dying nation, Father. Help us, Father, to do all things that we can and everything that we do put you first. These things we ask in your Son's name. Amen. As I look around the room this morning, as best I can tell, no husband here is looking for ways to leave his wife. And as far as I know, no wives here are looking for ways to leave their husbands. Oh, there is one sister here who occasionally talks about killing him, but she's not going to let him off that easy. <laughs> Still. No, no parent here is talking about abandoning their children. No one here is thinking about leaving any of their loved ones. However, there must be at least 50 ways to do so. So says Paul Simon in the song by that same name. 50 ways to leave your lover. And apparently it's easy to do. Or as the song says, if it seems difficult to you, the lyric says the problem is all inside your head. The answer is easy if you take it logically. And so I'd like to help you in your struggle to be free. There must be 50 ways to leave your lover. I bet you know some of those ways, don't you? Just slip out the back, Jack. Make a new plan, Stan. You don't need to be coy about it, Roy. Just get yourself free. Hop on the bus, Gus. Don't need to discuss much. 
Just drop off the key, Lee. Get yourself free. That's a strange way to begin a lesson, but that song came to mind this week as I was preparing for this lesson. And what is an introduction to a series of lessons? And that series is about keeping the saved saved. While we are compelled to go into all the world to teach the gospel to all that might believe, trusting that the gospel is the power of God to salvation for all who will believe, equally urgent, extremely urgent, is the work needed in the church to keep those who have believed, keeping them and one another saved. It's been heavy on my heart of late that if this congregation is long going to endure, we trust that God will cause her to endure. He's kept this family together for 46 years. I know he can do more the next 46. But we must also devote ourselves to keeping anyone from just slipping out the back or hopping the bus. From the Bible, it's fairly easy to see that there are, I haven't counted them, but I bet you could find 50 ways to leave the Lord. If you have it in mind to leave this family or to depart from the faith, you can find ways to do it. As the song says, as many people have actually done, just make a new plan, Stan. Just do your own thing, or rather than make your own plan, just begin to doubt God's perfect plan, and you'll find yourself free. I doubt the Christians in Ephesus actually planned to leave their first love. You know where that's from? The account of the seven churches, letters to the seven churches. I doubt they discussed much leaving Christ because we recall from Revelation chapter 2 that the angel to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2 and verse 2 said, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested the claim of those who claim to be apostles but are not and you have concluded they are false. Now all of that sounds so good so far, doesn't it? Apparently nobody's hopped the bus in Ephesus because you have persevered and you have endured hardships for my name and you have not grown weary. So no one's dropped off the key to the church building. And yet it's somehow evident to the Lord that even while they are present and active, that they have left their first love. Something about their devotion to Christ has changed. They have forsaken their first love. When we talk about keeping the saved saved, it includes both those we haven't seen in a long time and for every one of us who is here today. It includes many who have obeyed the gospel for their salvation, but they haven't been here for weeks or for years. You know, out of the, the eight people in recent years who have been baptized into the Lord's church, only two or three or to varying degrees, striving to be faithful. That's an urgent work for us to do, to help them grow, but also to restore and to keep all the rest. Jesus himself expressed the urgency of keeping the saved saved. Even as he prayed on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed, you'll remember in John chapter 17, before he died, as though he had already died, and looking forward to those who would be saved and added to the Lord's church, he prayed for our, our keeping. In John chapter 17 and verse 11, Jesus said, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them. And not a one of them perished, but that son of perdition, so that scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them 
because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. The word Jesus spoke for keeping means to observe. He's praying to his heavenly father that God in heaven will watch over all of his children. He's praying that he will observe their, their ways and he'll observe their attitudes and their actions. And he's observing them in order to preserve them for heaven. Jesus' word for keeping, it means to attend to carefully and to guard. Jesus' prayer is attend, akin to those I remember hearing so often growing up. When godly leaders in the church would pray, Lord, guard, guide, and direct us. Or sometimes they say, Lord, guard, guide, and protect us. But in, in many ways, that is the word that Jesus uses for keeping. To guard, guide, and direct us. Even to direct us away from the evil one. It is the prayer of our brother Gary when he prays, Lord, keep us from the evil one. Striving to keep the saved saved is the purpose of the revelation in all the New Testament letters. You see, of all that has been written from cover to cover in God's word, much more is written about keeping the saved than bringing the lost to their initial salvation. It's, it's always been the challenge for, to, to keep those in God's care. God is observing, God is guarding, God is protecting, but some people don't put, remain in a place where he can do so. And so, yes, this series of lessons is about the many in Salmon who have obeyed the gospel but are not among us. We're concerned this morning for Austin and David and for Ted and for Russ and for Linda, for Artie and Jack and Kathy, for Bonnie and Cliff, for Mark and for Marcus. We're concerned for many who have been away because of severe hardships, sometimes for mental distress and addictions. But this lessons and those to come is also about each one of us here. I don't know anyone here is planning to drop off the key or hop in the bus to Calvary's Chapel, but we've seen it happen too many times. And yet we still must be concerned for the saints who are physically present, but somehow are just a little detached or disengaged, disturbed by the distresses of life and doubting. Why? Why must we be concerned? Because we are, in fact, our brother's keeper. Yes, we need to answer Cain's question in Genesis 4 and verse 9. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is an emphatic yes. That's why we are concerned for those who have fallen away and those who are present as well. Present but somehow lacking in faith. Because in either case, both are in danger. Those saints in Ephesus who are engaged in the work but lacking in a love for Christ, they are in danger. And the danger is apostasy. The soul of one who even now is busily going through the works and the motions of worship, and that's all there is, works and motion, is in serious danger. Apostasy, we don't talk about it often, need to do so more, I suspect. It has been defined as the rejection of the faith, either in part or the whole, by someone who was or even is a Christian. Apostasy is a defection. It is a departure. It is a decision to rebel or to revolt. It's either a conscious decision or one carelessly made simply by not giving attention to the truth and not giving attention to their own faithfulness. It's not always intentional, but it is nevertheless. 
It is a defecting, a departing, and because of doubting leads to rebelling and revolting. And so if I counted them, I bet we could find 50 ways to leave the Lord. Yet some ways are not intentional, not as the song says, not planned. Sometimes it's that not outright defection, but severe depression. Sometimes it's not departure, but an emotional detachment. When folks are here, but they're just hanging on the edge. Sometimes it's not willful deception, but a lack of conviction. Sometimes it's not willful apostasy, but it's careless apathy, which is uglier still, isn't it? Either way, apostasy or apathy, there's not really a dime's worth of difference in the eternal consequences of it. Both are the sad conditions of those who have left their first love. And so in the coming weeks, we're going to seek to understand the attitudes of those who are apostate. And because fewer today, fewer people today are willing to listen to the truth, and fewer still are willing to obey the truth, we see the urgency of keeping the saved saved. We mentioned earlier in the announcements, the young man who was here Wednesday night, his name is Kai Westfall. And I was visiting with him. He said, you know, people my age don't listen. So I asked him how old you are. He said, 26. He said, my generation just doesn't listen. They want to do their own thing. They want to make their own plan. And certainly they're not going to trust very easily somebody else's plan. They just don't listen. Sometimes when people have strayed from the faith, it happens even in the church not ready to listen, not as willing to obey. We, we see the urgency of keeping the saved saved. And this morning, in a few minutes, I'll offer one action, one suggestion that we can begin immediately. First, let's go back to our Bibles and see how this develops, where we can find in Scripture the many ways to leave the Lord. It's most obvious when we find the original word for apostasy. We see it two times and we'll consider two other times. But before we do that, we need to understand that every time there's a problem with someone falling away or straying or turn away, apostatizing, it's always tied to a deception. Whether that deception is a willful one of false teachers or someone just by the trials and burdens of life or just by not paying careful attention to their spiritual condition, will be deceived. We see it first in Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21 in verse 21. You'll recall that's when Paul and his fellow workers have returned to, to rejoice in, in the success of the mission. There's been much success in converting believers to Christianity. But there are influential Jews on the scene who are intent on preventing anyone else who might believe from being saved. And they're doing so in Acts 21 and verse 21 by claiming that Paul is, is teaching people to forsake Moses. Teach, alleging that he's telling people not to have their children circumcised or not to continue in the customs of the law. Allegedly, Paul is inciting people to revolt against Almighty God. But we understand in reality, he's causing people to see Jesus as their only and their first love. The second place that we see this word for apostasy is in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. And just as it was in Acts 21, these people who are disturbed in their faith, doubting in their faith, it's tied to a deception. Apostasy is always linked to being deceived. You'll likely recall the situation in Thessalonica. False teachers had come in and they were upsetting the faith of many Christians. They taught that those who had died, their loved ones in the grave had missed the second coming of Christ and therefore would never be raised. 
What's the answer to that? Paul comes in and he says regarding the second coming of Christ, he explains that prior to Christ's return, apostasy will come first. Often we think about the evil in the world, but apostasy can only happen in the church. And tragically among Christians, there will be an open revolt, an open rebellion against the will of God. Now, those are the two places that we find the word for apostasy. But we, the concept pervades Scripture. It's found in the related words which mean to turn away, to go away, to withdraw, to, to, repart, to depart, to, to fall away. Sometimes intentional. Sometimes not. Even before the church was established, there was much concern. Jesus himself expressed much concern about what happened to some who by faith would be added to the Lord's church. We see it in the parable in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and verse 13, Jesus spoke to those who had believed for a while, but having no firm root, then in the time of temptation will fall away. The church had not even yet been established. We had not entered this present age of Christianity. And Jesus himself is concerned about the temptation in these last days, in this present time. And whether it is in the world, the focus here is on the church. Within the church, there's this twisted notion that Christians are free to do as we please. You know, believe as I was raised, believe as you want, so long as you're sincere and you live by it, God would be pleased. And those who having no firm root in the faith will, in essence, figuratively speaking, hop on the bus with Gus. The, but again, figuratively speaking, that's not a bus. That's not a load of people who will ever enter the kingdom of God. So we find in Scripture, just as Jesus expressed concern about it, then the Holy Spirit is also concerned for those who have been saved by faith. We find that in 1 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 1. Again, concerned about the temptation in this present age. The Holy Spirit, in this case, explicitly says that some will fall away from the faith by paying attention to deceitful, that word keeps popping up every place, doesn't it? By paying attention to deceitful spirits and the instruction of demons. You see, these would be the folks that song says will, will begin to find it a little easier. They'll even consider it logical to leave the church. They'll just make a new plan. How many have done so? Just make a new plan. Their own plan. And they deliberately set themselves free. They think. I shared with you last week the account of a sister in the church in Texas where we lived 40 years ago. Recently posting quite a bit on Facebook about her joy of finally breaking free of the church of Christ. Celebrating it. Deceived. Wasn't there somebody to, to hang on to her? The, the Spirit, Jesus has testified. The Holy Spirit has testified. Now, there are only four of perhaps 50 ways to leave the church. And yet the faith of others, the apostles write, the faith of some will suffer shipwreck. Others will miss the mark. They know the standard of obedience and righteousness the gospel requires, but not striving to meet that, not having a devotion and a love for the things of God in Christ to, to want to meet that, they'll miss the mark. Others will just go away. John 6 and verse 66, they'll hear the word of Christ and they will just go away. Or they will turn away, or they will change, they will revert to their former ways, they will alter the truth rather than abiding in the truth. I suppose there are 50 ways to leave. Many will choose to fall. 
I said earlier, some will deliberately choose, some will carelessly, in effect, choose, simply not by paying attention to obedience and to keeping God's word. They will choose to fall. Maybe that doesn't sound too serious to folks in the world today. I, I, I don't know. But we have to understand that in the New Testament, to fall is to more than stumble and break a leg from which you can recover. We can break two legs and two arms and recover from all of that. But to fall, spiritually speaking, is a catastrophic failure. It leads to the loss of salvation and to eternal ruin. I am certain that we can see the urgency of this. It is why the, one of the famous texts concerning apostasy is in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Again, writing to the saints in the church, those who no doubt had been saved according to the gospel. Hebrews 3 and verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you where to fall away that's the only way only direction it can go is to fall away from the living god but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin oh but we were just making that little change we just made that little plan and and so many people came so many people liked it it had to be okay. No, they were hardened by that change, by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold fast our original confidence firm to the end. What's our original confidence? The gospel of Christ. All that God has done in Christ through that gospel revealed and proven in his own life. It's not the confidence that we might have in another so-called gospel. It's not the confidence that we might find we assume there is in our own plan. It's that original confidence based on that original confession of faith. According to Hebrews 3 and verse 12. In that church, apostasy already existed in the hearts of those people. Apostasy consists of any self-willed movement away from God. Just that movement itself is a sin. Self-willed. Again, it's either a conscious decision or it could be a careless indecision. Just the indecision not to pursue faithfulness, the indecision to just go with the flow. It is a choice which must be avoided at all cost, since as the Hebrew writer says, it results in our being separated from the living God, which is to be accept, separated from hope, which is to be separated from the source of life itself. That's why I've expressed and deeply felt the urgency to push in this work needed to keep the saved saved. Yes, we are to keep teaching the gospel so that all would have an opportunity to believe. But the overwhelming weight of New Testament scripture compels us at all costs to keep the saved saved. Certainly we know, just as God has always done, God is powerful in working to keep for himself a holy people. He is powerful in working and purifying for himself an eternal holy race. But see what the Hebrew writer does? He lays the Lord's work squarely on your lap and on mine, doesn't he? We are the keepers. Yes, Jesus prays to the Father in heaven who, yes, he is keeping us. But we are the tools of his keeping, are we not? We're the tools of his keeping. by which Jesus meant to guide and guard and direct. We are to be diligent to preserve all the saved, to provide 
watch care for the strain to protect each other from the evil one. It is the purpose of every New Testament letter in the Revelation. It's the work that you and I are given to do. We are the keepers. For that reason, I will make just one suggestion today. It's not original to me. I got the wording of it from all places from my doctor. And while you might not initially like the sound of it, I'm going to tell you it's biblical and it is effective. And it's called active surveillance. Did your doctor ever use that phrase with you about active surveillance? For some medical maladies that aren't urgent, active surveillance is now recommended. It's not like spying on your neighbor. It's not like you're trying to just catch them doing something wrong. No, it's, it's watching someone's behavior, paying attention to their attitudes, observing their activities, just for the purpose of better understanding the danger that may trouble them, understanding how to better influence the situation for good. One of my neighbors told me that, you know, Paul, we've been watching what you've been building over there. And he was watching me just to catch me doing something wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. We're not talking about surveilling to find fault, but to find a solution. The solution in order to preserve life. Active surveillance is done openly. It's done with the expression of my love and your love, our concern for one another. Surveillance is a way of taking care that there would not be in any Christian here what the Hebrew writer called an evil, unbelieving heart. Perhaps you've wondered, well, how could anyone who's made the good confession ever be described as having an evil, unbelieving heart? It doesn't mean that they have not believed. It doesn't believe, mean even that they do not believe. But they are by degrees coming to some measure of disbelief. That word for unbelieving is the word that Jesus used when speaking to those of little faith. Sure, they've got some faith. But they were worried about food and clothing and shelter, and they were worried about all the trials that would come against them. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Oh, they believe in Christ. But they do not trust only in Christ. That's what's happening in the Hebrews letter, isn't it? They have been saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But now they've come to doubt that that, Christ, that sacrifice is sufficient for the eternal salvation. That, that's evil, but not intentionally evil. This word for evil means to, to be pressed down by the trials of life, to be disturbed by deceptions. It is that doubting in your heart. Evil is that debate that rages within us when well, our head believes, but our heart doesn't. You ever had that situation? With the head you believe, but the heart's not quite into it? For that reason, the Hebrew writer says, Hebrews 13 and verse 12, take care, brothers. In other words, survey. Survey the actions and the attitudes and the dangers, the distresses coming against your brothers and sisters. It's, it's biblical, it is effective, just as it was for the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. Those who were keeping watch over their flocks by night. Surveillance is seen in Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6. Watch out! Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Surveillance is what godly leaders are doing in Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Those who are watching out for your souls are instruction to take care of our brothers and sisters. We are in that way the answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17. Yes, it is the Father that is keeping us. But even Jesus' prayer 
lays it upon the leaders of the church to be kept. And by that he meant. We are to guard, guide, and direct. We are to be our brothers and sisters keepers. I'm simply urging us, myself included, to take this work more seriously. To guard, guide, and direct one another towards our eternal salvation. Can I suggest this morning that we would commit ourselves to inviting into our homes or even inviting into our tight personal circle the one who is has departed now i know there are cases when that's not appropriate to do but for the one that is departing how can we expect them to return to the church if we have not invited them into our hearts into our homes into our personal space i would urge us to think about inviting that brother or sister who thinks he or she is worthless the one who feels like they wouldn't be missed if they weren't here the one who feels like they don't have anything much to offer this family the one who would feel alone even in the midst of a big potluck we need to invite them into our home I think it's easy, it's too easy to, to treat those who are falling away, if I can use a political word, to treat them as the deplorables. We see people who are drifting away and we look at them and we say, how can they do that? Those people are deplorable. We may not say it, but what's the truth of the matter? By God and all the host of the angels in heaven, they are the desirables. As you well know, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over that one who repents than over all the rest. They are the desirables. The urgent work of this church is to keep the saved saved. To guard, guide, and direct those who are not here and those who are. And to be God's tools in our keeping. This morning... We talked about the original confidence that one could have in the gospel. It's talking about the original confession. Are we still strong in that confession? Is it truly our confidence? Is it that confession that is, is, is keeping us devoted to Christ so that we are not in any way leaving our first love? that original confidence, that original confession. We earnestly, seriously do need to hold close to us and dearly to us, each one here, but also those who are straying. I personally need to do far better than that, at that. Many of you I know are good at sending cards there's so many ways you might do it personally. But we need to hold one another close. It is the weight of Scripture, isn't it? To keep those whom God has saved, saved for His eternal inheritance. As you may have need this morning, though, for your, yourself in correcting anything by which you may have been deceived to recognize your need maybe recognize in yourself some area that you have been close to turning away some sense that your soul has been in danger won't you respond then to the Lord's invitation this morning as together we stand and sing